Welcome to uh, Anyway Club channel. We're here today uh, for the talk on uh, what is the product mindset for developers, for engineers. I invited Alexis Drazdowskis. He's the Associate Director and Experience Consultant at Eat Continue. And uh, he helps clients to transition from project to product. And he worked for global agency networks and he worked on client side and on agency side. So a very experienced guy. Welcome. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure. Yeah. I'm looking forward to indeed diving into product mindset for our engineering cloud. So today we'll be talking also about the careers advancement. Uh, so how it can affect your career. Yeah. And we are going to talk about how uh, product mindset is going to make an impact for you personally as an engineer. But let's start from the beginning. Let's start with definitions. So what is a product mindset actually? That's a good question. What do you think about? Uh, well, from my point of view, it's some kind of a philosophy uh, that is uh, centered about uh, around creating solutions that is valuable for customers, for users, for, mm. and the focus is on users. And um, one of the important parts of that is product discovery part, the phase. How do you think about that? Indeed, I think this uh, focus on what are the needs, it essentially discovering the needs of your users, of your customers, and how that is connected with our capabilities in the business, what we can actually build efficiently for them to fulfill those needs. I think that's the key. And I, I completely uh, support the idea of highlighting the product discovery for that reason. Because uh, often, uh, yeah, often it's something that we perhaps go through too quickly or, or whatever. Yeah, just, uh, just assume that we know everything about our customers, right? Let's be honest, sometimes that happens with us, and especially when we spend a lot of time in the same category with the same product, we feel like we just know everything about why it's created, what are the problems and the needs it's solving. And I, I would argue that, yeah, every now and then going out and actually observing, talking um, to your customers, to your users is very refreshing and it's very, very much needed. Yeah. And I'm thinking about here first, I'm thinking about what is the difference between uh, like discovery and uh, research, the, the, you know, the uh, customer research and the discovery. From my point of view, that uh, the difference is that uh, research is like more passive, like uh, acquiring some information about that. And discovery is like, um, you know, proactive or like doing something with it. Mm. Interesting. I never thought about it in this way. I think for me, as a ship, product discovery, it's, um, it's a particular way to do the research, I would say. So for me, it's definitely a research activity, uh, product discovery, which can involve all sorts of different you know, ways to do it, engage with your uh, audience, with your uh, uh, clients and customers and users. Perhaps I can understand why you distinguish those two, because I think often indeed um, research can be something that is um, a lengthy program, which is aimed to, I don't know, analyze the entire category and, and do a lot of kind of power lifting. And I think that's also very important, but perhaps when you say product discovery, you, you talk about all the activities that are more lean, more agile, more, um, I guess, less resource, um, uh, resources required. So you can move faster, you can do very simple iterations and get some insights from, from the people. I would like to, uh, take off the hat of a product manager and a, and a business wise guy and put on the hat of an engineer and ask you, okay, if I am an engineer, why do I, why should I care about that? Explain to me, why should I care about the discovery about the business value that we bring? I'm, I'm, you know, I'm focused on uh, engineering. Right. I believe for, um, engineers and developers that perhaps want to have a faster career growth, uh, to have a seat at the table, each in all those business conversations and potentially have more impact on the business decisions going outside of the te technological scope. Uh, I think it's a very important, uh, ability to have all those conversations around 
what is the value for the business? What is the value for the customer? That mindset, that business mindset helps me as an engineer get more power to get more authority in the company. You can, I, I think one can think about it this way. Yes, it's, uh, it's about um, having more influence overall. So as for me as an engineer, let's say I'm a middle, uh, I'm a very talented engineer in the middle, in the middle position and I want to grow, but I don't want to be the manager. I don't want, if I wanted to be a manager, I would just, you know, take off the hat of an engineer and I'll put on the hat of a manager and go for managing. But I want to be a better engineer. How would it, that help me mm. in terms of a career development? That's a very good question as well. I think not surprisingly, there are principal roles emerging, I think, in more and more companies. Uh, for that reason, that some people just don't want to uh, engage into other people's um, development or basically managing other people, um, they prefer to focus on 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 that thing that they are uh, working with. So, in, in this context, obviously, it's uh, technology, and um, still in the principal roles. Often experts would be approached by people from non-technical roles, and um, you, as a principal engineer, as a senior engineer, without a team that you're managing, still the expectation would be for you to be able to engage into those conversations with stakeholders from the business side, perhaps the client side, and. Yeah, and, and, and just to be very much aware of that context. So at some point, um, I think it, it can be also limiting for the career not to have that ability to engage into those conversations. So that is, um, that is one of the ways. Well, I would add that from the perspective of career development, if I want, don't want to get to managerial positions, but I want to be like more senior and uh as a developer and um uh nevertheless i need to like accelerate my knowledge about what do we do it for and make the right decisions because i want if you want to grow if i want to grow i want to be involved in better projects that are more successful and you know it's a thing of making choices making right choices not wrong choices and be to to which board to choose to switch mm -hmm. and uh if you don't have this business vision, this mindset business-wise, you like it would be much easier for you to make a mistake in that and choose the wrong horse mm. to bet on. Yeah, that's a, that's a very good point, Rowan. I think it's yeah, it's 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 indeed having more pers like a broader perspective. Right? So you have a broader perspective, you have a little bit better understanding, and you make better choices. Hopefully, so. Yeah, well. It's great that we started to, to, to take about uh, to talk about choices, actually, because actually the mindset is the reason why you make this or that choice, right? And uh, if we are referring to choosing not only the projects that we are applying to, not only the client that we are like, uh, should we work with that client or the, with this client, but uh, even uh, choosing the making the decisions of you know. What feature to take from the backlog, like technically, right? Mm -hmm. The one that is you like more, it's interesting for you to make it, or it, it will make value for the client, for the for the user. Because even if you take the feature that is more interesting to you in terms of development, and it will not work from business perspective, it will not be used actually, right? And you are just you know working in vain. Actually, no one will see this beauty. Right. Yes, that's another good point. Essentially, uh, we talked a little bit about the, you know, uh, the meaning uh, that one can have for, for kind of internal reasons. But I think in this case, it's also about creating that value for, especially if you work for, um, for a client and developing, creating something on their behalf. Uh, this is very much needed to, to have this awareness make better decisions and uh, support your business partners basically by making better technical business customer related decisions yeah you you become a more business wise guy a more proactive person and uh, in terms of promotion yeah let's talk about promotion who gets more promotion 
what, which engineer is going to take more promotion from your perspective? Soft skills, hard skills have been a, a significant topic discussed, right? And I think um, product mindsets or being business savvy, ability to communicate around those topics while being a technical person, while being an excellent uh, talented engineer. I think it is exactly about that ability to build on top of your hard skills, all those soft skills, um, like having ability to engage with a conversation with a customer, a user, or a business partner, and and actually comprehend and actively listen, and then somehow take all that information on board and make better decisions. So, if this is the setting. If this is how it works, then for sure, uh, carrier progression and promotions are more often happening with the engineers who decide that on top of the all hard skills that they have, excellent skills, they don't stop there and they developed the soft part of their, um, professional, uh, picture and they evolve. How do you think, uh, let's discuss the other topic about, uh, from your experience, uh, have you faced the, uh, conflict, uh, like not to say conflict, but tension between, uh, engineering teams and business teams because between business and engineering and, uh, how could the product mindset for the engineers decrease that tension? I definitely faced, um, various situations like that. I think those are universal. It just reminds us of our human nature in a way. Even speaking of our communication, right? We now we speak English, but not necessarily uh, we absolutely understand all the kind of nuances that we are trying to communicate. And when it gets into more complex topics around you know, business and engineering and there is a customer perspective somewhere on the side and then there is a business perspective, technical perspective. So, um, a lot of those issues, a lot of the issues around the silos and et cetera, it has to do with, uh, culture in general in the workplace. I think that is also very much important as someone who worked with a number of organizations, both in-house and as a consultant, uh, I've seen multiple cultures and I was fortunate to observe also cultures where uh, agile principles, uh, were much cared about and promoted transparency, almost no hierarchy, um, a lot of engagement into what people are doing and this desire kind of to listen and hear each other and, and, and then having sort of, uh, perspective that in the end of the day, regardless of the roles, you know. Are we talking about engineers or are we talk about product managers or designers or marketeers, or analysts or CFO or CEO and COO? It doesn't really matter because in the end of the day, they're building something that will be used by the customers that they're serving and that those customers either will pay for this because it helps them to solve some of their problems, eliminate some of their uh, needs. Uh, facilitate some of those. And, um, yeah, I think this is a very healthy perspective to have. And then all the arguments are way more constructive when you take that perspective of what makes more sense for customers, because often when you build something that makes sense for customers, money will follow. And this is also a obvious conversation to have and I think engineers, developers benefit a lot from ability to have those conversations, to have the seat at the table and bring the technological perspective yet to engage in a meaningful conversation around the business, around the customer and, and make the best decisions together. When you, uh, you were talking about this, I was, you know, thinking about that the start of our conversation where you, you were talking about uh, product to product transformation. And I remembered that when I was doing that in one company, I of course, no names, but uh, when I was doing, I was involved in project to product transformation one company, there was a situation when, you know, uh, there were like, uh, when I came, it was like the beginning of the transformation. It was like, there were 52 products with, uh, about 80 product managers mm. and only, only 
I believe 10% of them were real product managers and the other ones, all the other ones, ones was like project managers because it was project to product transformation. Mm-hmm. And they were like project managers who were like uh, sent to some, you know, three months courses on product management. Uh, like, so they learned some theory mm-hmm. along with working on their projects. And they say, okay, now you have a head of a product manager, go for it. And, uh, you know, my job was like making them think like a product manager because I realized then that um, that uh, product management tools and knowledge as uh, specific tools are only a, a small part of the transformation because mindset also, like mindset means a lot. So product culture means a lot. Uh, the culture within the organization, the culture within the head of each of them, like managers and engineers as well. And while doing this, you know, uh, bringing uh, all the engineering stuff, all the teams to one place and having these activities together on, you know, planning, what are the goals, what are we doing? And you know that lots of ideas on what to do came from engineers, not from product managers. There was like, okay, we're listening. Okay, this is good and this is good. So great talent because because they are not thinking about that from in their day to day life. I mean, the the uh, the engineers and they got fresh, real fresh air on that, on the on that point of view, and um, and the third one, the third pillar of transformation is like from my point of view it is itself the transformation itself the change management process because. Because really, if you, if you just tell everyone about the culture, tell everyone, okay, now from, day, from this day, we're thinking about, we think it this way, we're working this way. Okay, but they say uh, there's so, so much pushback. Why should we? Yes. How to deal with that? I believe Peter Drucker said something along the lines that um, culture fits strategy for breakfast. And I think uh, a lot of what you said is... Um, referring to being more strategic in your approach to projects, right? And eventually, if you're more strategic, uh, more contextual, more business-focused, customer-focused, um, that makes you sort of one with the product mindset, right? And um, indeed, culture is very hard to change because culture practically it is uh, you know, what you're doing when nobody's watching, right? And um, uh, especially if there is a long-term established culture in the organization, it can be very challenging for someone to step in and, and change that overnight. Even though we know some cases of um, very bold leaders stepping in and changing a lot of things overnight, even quite recently, <laughs> especially bringing a sink to the office. Are you referring to Elon Musk? Yes, for example. <laughs> um, yeah. So, so um, yeah, culture is it, changing. A culture is not a walk in the park. Let's put it this way. Right? It's hard, and um, I think it can be very challenging for people. And I think it's always uh, it's always good to just understand uh, what are uh, what are you want to be a part of that process or not? Do you have energy for that or not really? As we started to talk about the uh, uh, product culture and product mindset, I would like to mention that we also had that experience while changing the culture for one of the clients uh, uh, during our program Engineering Excellence Culture that I was working for. That is an excellent, excellent program. I And uh, yeah, I would I would like to say that you know that what is culture actually a culture is like a thing that cannot be enforced but only nurtured within the minds because you cannot make people do something they don't want to, do, to make because they don't feel the value and while you lose con- uh, when you while you stop controlling them they will not continue to do that and that's the main idea about why culture means yeah absolutely I- I think that's exactly what I meant when I was saying, you know, culture, essentially, it's uh, how do you behave when nobody's watching shit. It's exactly it. It's, it, it needs to be reinfor- reinforced from from within, you know, and it goes to all the, uh, like, applies to all the specific little situations, like, you know, 
Uh, you know that nobody will be checking your whatever documentation, et cetera. And still, how would you approach it? But so uh, how clear that would be, how, I mean, maybe that will not happen in the following few months, but like, if you're working on something critical and what if, you know, um, sometime in the future, and this could be something that would save a lot of time for someone taking over some of your projects or, and so this is also an example of perhaps a product mindset, more strategic mindset, when you think and you care about other people working with you and you're caring about how is it easy or not that easy to work with you with all the assets and with all the kind of artifacts that you're producing in your work. So we were talking about culture and uh, let's switch a little bit so from uh, company-wise uh, to personal ones. Right. Uh, to how do you think about how the product mindset influence on the impact that the engineers have on their personal impact to something? Mm. When you when you say personal impact, meaning in their private lives, or no, 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 not private life. I mean, uh, doing something meaningful. I mean, um, you know, let's say about uh, a metaphor on uh, building castles from sand and getting them sw sw swiped away by the water, mm -hmm. or building castles from bricks, and they stand, or someone. Uh, or someone lives there in these castles, or, or no one lives in these castles, you know. And someone who built a lot of castles from the sun when I was a kid, I have no problem with that, but... Uh, and it, it can be that it, it, it can illustrate really the difference, because uh, the guys who are doing product discovery yeah. are the ones who build castles from sand all the time, which they exactly. get swiped away easily, and they don't care. Exactly, you, you don't attach yourself too much, right? I think the problem is indeed when you build something you know, to last, sort of from concrete, and then all of a sudden it's, you know, it's a ghost town, if I continue your metaphor, right? It's like it's just not being utilized, it's not being used, it's not being desired. And um, yeah, well, I guess uh, the point you're making is, and I think we already touched upon this, um, Marty Kagan brings it very nicely, what he says that you have mercenaries, and you have missionaries. I do believe that it's not like good or bad. It's just two different characters. And actually, in a particular context, you either want to have one or another one. So I think sometimes a mercenary type of a mindset, someone who, like you said, would not care too much, would not attach too much to those castles, whatever the material they are being are from, um, it's actually very good for the context of, you know, there are sometimes very heavy projects. They're very, I don't know, intensive or like speed wise, maybe slower, maybe in other ways too fast. And basically you need to, to move and you just need to do a certain thing and not attaching yourself too much can be a very good thing. But then obviously more often than not, there are situations where if you are going through a hard time with your project, having this understanding of um impact of that thing you're building a software product what is the dent on you know in the world that this product actually creates what is the value for the customers how it actually changes their day-to-day -day life having understanding how what you're creating impacts other people can give you a lot of energy and motivation to go through hard times when you struggle with building that thing Mm -hmm. It can give you motivation. It can it basically okay, it can help you with prevention of the burnout, because one of the criteria for the burnout is not seeing the meaning in what you do. It's a definition by academia by multiple scientists. Right, it's one of the most important parts in in, in the burnout syndrome. So I think uh, yeah, it's very important to know. Getting back to discovery, uh, let's uh, talk about uh, failure rates because. Um, the uh, research shows that there's like uh, uh, there's uh, like failure rates for like sixty five to ninety percent. I mean, for the features that are made and uh, developed and never used or very seldom used. So, me as a developer, I would not like to make features that are not used. I would like to make the the, the features that are that really make sense that they matters. What do you think about that? A consultant answer would be it depends. 
because again, it, it really depends on the nature of your motivation. What what do you like? Right? What motivates you? I think again, um, in some particular context, that can be totally fine for someone not to be much involved into into thinking of uh, of that impact. But like we just discussed, perhaps um, for those who are more passionate and ambitious about the work, about their career, about what is that dent they want to create in the world. It's definitely very important. When you do a discovery and you uh, and you see that, that what you have done is not used during the discovery cycles, these small disappointments compared to the big disappointments, when you are building, okay, well, you are building castles from sand, once again to the castles, uh, you're building castles from sand uh, during the discovery cycles, and you see they are not used, small, small. Uh, it's working. It's just not, not working. Right. They're not used because this it's a failure. It's a mistake, and you're just researching it. Yeah, yeah. You're like discovering it the uh, the perfect way how to do it, the way that works. But if you don't do that, if you miss that discovery and you start building castles from concrete, yeah. And no one lives there. It's a big disappointment. So, but uh, while you are building it, you have a, you you have a feeling that you are building something great. But after that, you get more disappointment. Right, right. Because you again, you attach yourself to that, and you yeah. yeah. And and for that reason, I think that because we we can refer to uh, Nawaz Ravikant, who said, "What did he say about that?" Hard decisions now, easy life later. Yeah. Easy decisions now, hard life later. Yeah, it's like small disappointments now, easy life later. later. Easy life now, big disappointments later. <laughs> yeah. yeah, perhaps that can be uh, in one or another way. Yeah, it's something. Yeah. I think another good perspective, um, which I think also is widely discussed these days, after Jeff, Jeff Bezos brought it up in a couple of interviews, is uh, this idea of two-way doer and one-way doer decisions. And the truth is that most of the decisions we make actually are two-way door decisions. It's, you know, you can walk in and you can walk out and, you know, not much will change. Um, but we often think that, oh, but, you know, we open this door and then, you know, sort of, there is no way back. But in reality, actually, there is often a way back. Uh, often there is a way back. And um, yeah, it, it requires a lot of mental, mental flexibility and like not bashing yourself too, too, too much to what you're building. Yeah, it's a little bit like philosophy here. But it, this is actually what we were referring to. I mean, what, what we wanted to talk about, not only about the so pro mindset is philosophy, first of all, from the definition that we started. From. Yeah, well, since you brought up the philosophy topic, I mean, I think a lot of this comes even from Stoics. I think a Stoic philosophy is a very helpful philosophy for anyone in a fast-based technological environment. Like you say, building those castles, destroying those because they're not working, they're not serving the purpose in, in, the, in the end of the day. So again, it's really about understanding the purpose and um, and then doing everything that what it takes mm -hmm. to achieve that purpose. Mm -hmm. And if your purpose is to create something that will solve particular problems and the needs for the group of people you're selected to create something for, mm -hmm. then it's just like everything else is uh, doesn't matter. Let's just uh, uh, sum it up and make a little recap of what we're talking about today. So the product mindset, first of all, is a culture shift in the brains, right? Pretty much, yeah. It's, um, I mean, I wouldn't say it's a cultural shift in the brain, but for sure it's a, it's a shift in the perspective to take, which often is not the natural perspective to take for a person. And then if you take that perspective, then you change your behavior and then the culture, start, like the rituals, the, the ways we operate, we cooperate with other people, that changes as well. And it's actually the reason for making the right choices. Having more chances to make the better choices for sure. Better choices. I like to say there are no, there are little guarantees, even though we're all professionals and everything, but uh, there is always a little chance that something will go wrong. And I think product mindset also reminds us that you need to be okay about it. We just start, start all over again. 
Great. So the third thing that we were discussing today is like about uh, decreasing the tension in the teams and decreasing burnout in the teams, personal burnout, because you're doing things that doesn't make sense, that you're and don't don't make value in the in the end of the day, right? Not not, not meaningful, sort of. Not yeah. meaningful. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so it brings more meaning, and the meaning is something that if everybody is on the same page about that meaning that they're creating, about what that product, that service they're creating is actually doing for the world, for the customers, for the business, mm-hmm. then it helps to be more aligned, right? Go faster, solve those problems together, have less arguments. And just have more fun. Yeah. And uh, the fourth part is about career advancement, right? So product mindset helps you as an engineer to advance your career. That's that's one of the keys, I believe, sure. Um, definitely a lot of people will benefit significantly from developing product mindset and, and then um, getting that seat at the table and, and influencing a lot of business decisions. So thank you for the interview. Thank you for inviting. Yeah, thank you for that talk. I appreciate uh, it. To conclude this video, check the links uh, in the uh, description. And there will be links if you want to succeed with your career in engineering. Anywhere Club is going to help you. There are lots of courses and career paths, advancement, webinars. Subscribe and uh, check it out. Also, if you have something to ask us about the uh, plot of the video, ask in comments and we'll answer or maybe make one more video and uh, hope your career develops and uh, hopefully it was uh, reasonable thank you for watching thank you guys thank you Robert for having me